let's verify the normalization condition for the wave function of a particle in a three-dimensional rectangular box. I derived this expression for the wave function in the previous video. I started with the time-independent Schrodinger equation, and then I used the method of separation of variables to create this expression over here. So I wrote psi as the product of three functions that only depend on one variable. So I had x, which was only a function of x, y, which was only a function of y, and z, which was only a function of z. And we found that there were actually not just one version of these functions, but an infinite number of versions of each of these functions. And they were all specified by these integer values, nx, ny, and nz. So the capital letters over here denote the functions, and the lowercase letters denote the coordinates. So we found that x was associated with this function over here, y was associated with this function, and z was associated with this function. You can see that they all have the same form. The only difference is nx and y and nz have a different subscript. There's a specific integer for each of the coordinates. And the length over here, this a and this b and this c, is different for each of these ones. These lengths, a, b, and c, can be seen on the diagram over here. So this is our 3D rectangular box. The dimensions of the box are a, b, and c. So a, b, c is associated with x, y, z. So we're dealing with a particle in a box. So the potential inside the box is zero. That's what this v stands for. So v inside the box is zero. And outside we have an infinite potential, which means the uh, walls of the box are effectively impenetrable barriers. So the wave function is only non-zero inside the box. And these are all the possible uh, wave functions that we can get. We just need to specify these three integers. The most general possible wave function is a linear combination of these wave functions. So a linear combination with all of the different values of these integer values here. So you could have the lowest possible value is 1, 1, 1. That would be the ground state. And then if we wanted to go to higher uh, energy values or higher energy uh, values that are associated with these eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator, we would just change these guys over here. And then we would take a linear superposition or a linear combination, and that would give us the general solution. And from that, we can actually work out the time evolution by multiplying each of these ones in the linear combination by a complex exponential. And we did that for the one-dimensional case a few videos ago in the quantum mechanics playlist. But the purpose of this video is actually to verify the normalization condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this form over here, and I'm going to integrate it over all of this, over all of this box. But I'm not just going to integrate it. I'm going to take the square integral. And I'll show you that in a second. But first, what I want to do is I want to just uh, describe what's going on over here. So the reason we have this form is because of the method of separation of variables when solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation. That's because these guys are actually the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator. And the associated eigenvalues are the allowed energy levels. So that is why we have this form. And when we multiply these guys together, we can group these constants out the front into a single constant. You can see that the twos can be grouped together. We have three twos, so that's two to the power of three, or 2 cubed, and that gives us 8. And in the bottom, we have a, b, and c. So this is the normalization constant. And I'm going to show you that this normalization constant guarantees that these wave functions are all normalized. These individual normalization constants guarantee that each of these components, each of the x, y, and z functions, are individually normalized. And then when we multiply them together, we still get normalization. So let's go ahead and do that and do the proper integral. So how do we normalize a wave function? How do we ensure uh, that there is normalization? So what do we have to do? We have to integrate over the entire box. So I, normally, we would have to integrate over the entire domain. So x, y, and z would have to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. But there is no wave function outside the box. So we have a finite domain x, y, and z can only go in between 0 and each of these lengths, in between these lengths of a, b, and c. So that is the only place where we're going to have non-zero values. So we're just going to integrate over the box. And I'll write this in a kind of informal notation. 
and then we'll write the proper notation. Oop, I'll just write that a little bit better. So we're going to have, we're going to integrate over the entire box. We're going to have B O X, just integrate over the box. And this is just informal notation. And we're going to take the integral of psi star psi. And I'm just going to write psi over here as a condensed notation for all of this. So in reality, what we would have, if we were to write it in full, we would have three integers down here, and we would have to write the dependence. This would have to depend on x, y, and z. It depends on all three spatial coordinates. So I'm just going to write psi star times psi. And the really neat thing for us is that all of this is real. We have no imaginary numbers in here. So when we take the complex conjugate, uh, this wave function is just equal to its complex conjugate. So when we multiply psi star by psi, that's just going to be the same as squaring this entire function. Sometimes if you have wave functions that have complex exponentials or i, factors of i in, in various places, you would have to turn those i's into minus i's. And that's the process of complex conjugation. And if you have complex exponentials with minus i, that would turn to a plus i. And then you would multiply those two expressions and you would get psi star psi. So this over here, is the square of the wave function for us, because we're just dealing with real values. And what are we integrating with respect to? We're going to integrate over the volume. So I'm going to write dv. So v is a tiny little infinitesimal volume. You can think of it as a little cube that has sign lengths dx, dy, and dz. So that's what you can think of this guy over here. So what do we have over here? We have psi star times psi. And that, as we said, was the square of this wave function. So let's write this out in full. So I'll write this over here. This integral of the box is not just going to be a single integral. It's actually going to be a triple integral. We're going to have to integrate with respect to x, y, and z. So I'll write a triple integral over here. So we're going to have a triple integral, and that's the same as a volume integral. And then what am I going to write inside here? Well, this is going to get squared. So the square root is going to disappear. So we're going to have 8 over a, b, c. And then we're going to have to square all of these guys. And luckily for us, sine squares very nicely. It just turns into sine squared. And this is the notation for sine squared. And then we're just going to have to write all of these things inside of sine. So here we have nx pi over a, and that's times the x coordinate. And then we'll have the same thing for uh, y and z. And I want you to notice that we can easily break this up into three parts. And let me just complete writing this over here. So we have ny pi over b times y. And then finally, we're going to have a sine squared over here. And it's going to be sine squared of nz pi over c times z. And so this is the square of this function. Or it's the same as psi star times psi. So you can think of that as the probability density. So this is how we actually get the probability density function. The probability density comes from the wave function. So the wave function itself is not the probability. It is psi star psi, or the square of the amplitude of the wave function, that gives the probability density function. So here's what we've done. We've squared this constant term. That's gotten rid of the square root. And we've squared each of these signs. And the notation for that is sine with a little uh, superscript 2. And still we have all of this stuff inside is exactly the same. So what are we integrating with respect to? Well, we're going to have dx, dy and dz. So this tiny little infinitesimal uh, volume over here, dv, is the same as dx, dy, dz. So you can think of that as a really, really small cube that we're going to let, uh, we're going to take the limit as that cube goes to zero. We're going to uh, take uh, the limit and we're going to approximate what's going to happen. And in the limit that this dv goes to zero, then we actually have a sum that turns into an integral. So that is how integral calculus works. And this over here, this is multivariable integral calculus. And what else do we have to do over here? So we specify that this is dx, dy, dz. We need to specify the bounds of integration. So dx, dx is going to have to be specified by this diagram over here. x is going to go from 0 to a. So this is the origin. We're going to go from 0 to a. So I'll write 0 to a. And what about y? dy, well, y is going to go from 0 to b. That's the height of the box in this diagram. So we have 0 to b. And finally, z is going to go from 0 to c. You can see on the z-axis over here, 
We start off at zero, then we go a distance of c. So that's this distance over here. That's the same as this distance. So we have zero to c. Now, as I said before, you can break this function up into smaller functions. You can break it up into a product of three functions. One of those functions only depends on x, one of them only depends on y, and one of them only depends on z. In general, this is not true. In general, you can't use this trick that I'm about to use. But luckily for us, uh, we have this form. We can break this up into the product of functions. That comes from the method of separation of variables, because we use the method of separation of variables to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So now, let's break this integral up into smaller integrals. So I'll do that underneath. So what are we going to have? We're going to have this is going to equal, I'll take this constant out the front. So we have 8 over a, b, c. And we're going to have one integral that is only with respect to x. So we're just going to have this part over here. So we're going to have sine squared. We'll have nx pi over a times the coordinate x. And this is only with respect to x. And then we're going to multiply that by an integral with respect to y that only takes this part into account. So we'll have an integral from 0 to b of sine squared n y pi over b times y. And that's going to be with respect to y. And then finally, we'll have the integral with respect to z. And that's going to be the integral from 0 to c of the sine squared of n z pi over c times z. And that's going to be with respect to z. And let's have a look at what we get from this. So we have broken this integral up into the product of three smaller integrals. And each of these integrals are only integrals with respect to one coordinate. So we've taken a triple integral, a three-dimensional volume integral, and we've broken it up into a single variable calculus. Right? These are all single variable integrals. So you can see that they have a very similar form. There's always a sine squared, and we always have an nx uh, associated with x, an ny associated with y, and nz associated with z. And we also have a, b, and c associated with x, y, and z. So it's the same pattern that we've been seeing throughout these expressions. Now, what I want to do is I want to evaluate each of these ones. And I'm just going to take this one, and then, because we have the same form, I'm going to use the value that I get from this to uh, work out what values are present in these two integrals. So I'll do that underneath. So let's see what happens if we just take this guy over here. So we only consider the x integral. So the x integral is going to look like this. We're going to have the integral from 0 to a of sine squared. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the same thing that we have above. And then I'm going to use a trigonometric identity to simplify this integral. Because we don't really know what the general uh, equation for the integral of sine squared is. But we can write that in terms of an easier expression that we do know how to uh, take the integral of. So let's do that. We can write this as equal to the integral from 0 to a of this sine squared is the same as 1 half minus 1 half of cosine. And then inside the cosine, we have to double the angle. I'm going to write 2 pi nx, and I've just swapped the order of pi and nx, and we're going to divide by a, and we still have x, and this is all integrated with respect to x. So can you see what I've done here? I've just introduced a trigonometric identity. Sine squared is the same as 1 minus cos of 2 times the angle, all divided by 2. And I've just broken this, uh, I've distributed this factor of a half to each of these ones. If this trigonometric identity is unfamiliar to you, Make sure to watch the earlier videos in the Quantum Mechanics playlist where I discuss complex numbers and I derive some very useful trigonometric identities. So we have this trigonometric identity. Now let's take the integral. So over here, we don't know how to take the integral of sine squared, but we do know how to take the integral of these functions over here. This is just a constant. So I'll write this over here. What we're going to get is, I'll put it in some square brackets, uh, this guy over here, 1 half, well, that's going to turn into x over 2. Right? We're just integrating a constant. And what is going to happen to cosine? Well, cosine, when we integrate it, it's going to turn into sine. And we're still going to have this minus sine and this factor of a half. But we're going to have to use the chain rule. So we're going to have to take this coefficient over here, 
and we have to divide by that coefficient. And because we already have a 2 over here, this 2 is going to multiply this 2, and it's going to give us a 4. So I'll write that out over here. We're going to have minus, and we'll have a at the top, because we're inverting this, we're dividing by this coefficient. And then in the bottom, we're going to have 4 pi nx. And then we're going to multiply by sine of all of this stuff inside. So we're still going to have 2 pi nx over a, and we're multiplying by x. And we can close this bracket. And this has to be evaluated from x equals 0 to x equals a. So we're evaluating from 0 to a, because those are the bounds of integration over here. We're going from 0 to a. On the diagram, it corresponds uh, from going from the origin to a along the x-axis. And that's the same length over here. So we've got the same length over here as we do over here along the x-axis. So let's have a look at what's happened over here. So we've used the trigonometric identity, and we've integrated. And now we have to evaluate uh, these bounds of integration. What's going to happen if I substitute x equals 0 into this expression over here? Well, if x equals to 0 is substituted over here, this is just going to give 0. We're going to have 0 and 2. What about over here? If I put 0 in over here, what we're going to get is sine of 0. And if you remember from the unit circle, sine of 0 is 0. So we're not going to get any contribution if we substitute x equals to 0. But we will get a contribution if we substitute x equals a. So let's substitute x equals a. I'll write that underneath. So if we substitute x equals a, what we're going to get is this is going to turn into a. So we'll have a on 2. And what's going to happen to all of this stuff over here? Well, we'll still have this uh, coefficient of a divided by 4 pi and x. That's still there, right? That came from the chain rule. We had a half over here, and then we divided by this coefficient. And the 2s combined gave us a 4, and then we also had the pi and x, and a is on the top, because the a is on the bottom inside. And then we're going to multiply by sine of what's going to happen when we substitute a over here. We'll have a look at this. If we have an a down here, and we substitute an a for this x, these a's are going to cancel. There's an a in the numerator and the denominator. So those a's are going to disappear, and we're just going to have 2 pi and x. So 2 pi and x. But have a look at this. 2 pi times an integer over here is being inputted into sine. So now we need to think of the unit circle again. So this would be the angle associated with 0. So you can call that theta equals to 0. If we go 2 pi radians, that's going all the way around the unit circle. And if we do that an integer multiple of times, that's going around the unit circle, around the unit circle, and you're always coming back to theta equals 0. And over here, in the positive uh, horizontal axis, what are the coordinates of that? Well, the coordinates are 1 for the horizontal component and 0 for the vertical component. And sine tells us the vertical component. So sine is going to be 0. That's what we know from the unit circle. So make sure you watch the video on the unit circle if that is not familiar. So this is going to turn into 0. Why is that the case? Well, it's because nx is an element of the natural numbers. Or in other words, nx is a positive integer. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So all of those values are going to guarantee that sine of 2 pi nx is going to be equal to 0. So if this is 0, all of this term disappears, and the only thing we're left with is a on 2. So we got that the integral over here is a on 2. So now we can complete this integral up here. So all of this stuff over here is going to be equal to a on 2. What about these guys? Well, the only difference between this integral and these two integrals are the names that we're assigning these variables. So we have a different length over here. We have b and we have c. But the only difference inside is the name of the variable that we're integrating with respect to. And we can change them. We can change y to x. We can change z to x. What about this integer over here? Well, this is some integer that is a general integer. This is a positive integer. And it does not affect the final result. So it doesn't matter what positive integer we put in to this value of nx and y or nz, it's still going to be this length over 2. So that means that we can use this result to infer the results over here. So this 
is not going to be a on 2, it's going to be b on 2. And this one over here is going to be c on 2. It's, it's by the same reasoning as this red derivation over here. So when we evaluate the integrals, we're just going to get b on 2 and c on 2. So now we have a product over here. So we have the product of these three integrals. So we have to multiply these three constants by each other. But have a look at these three constants. Do they look familiar? Over here we have 8 over a, b, c. And over here we have a times b times c divided by 2 times 2 times 2. That's 8. So what we effectively have is 8 over a, b, c times a, b, c over 8. And these guys are reciprocals of each other. And so that's going to give me 1. And that's exactly what I wanted to show. This normalization constant over here has guaranteed that when I perform these integrals, I will be guaranteed to get 1. And that is the property of normalization. So all of these are normalized. So if we take linear combinations of them, and we specify that the coefficients have to satisfy the normalization condition as well, then we have that any wave function is normalized. So we have the normalization condition, and that means we can get meaningful probabilities out of these wave functions. And that is the goal of these wave functions. The goal of wave functions is to get probabilities and expectation values and variances. These are all things that are very important in the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. So this video has both shown that the one-dimensional case is normalized and the three-dimensional case is normalized. Because in the process of checking the normalization condition for the three-dimensional particle in a box, we've also checked the one-dimensional case. Right? This working down here, this verifies the normalization coefficient for the one-dimensional case. Because to normalize this, you just have to divide by this factor of a on 2. And if you divide by uh, this factor of a on 2, you get 2 on a. But remember, this is the square. This is the square of the wave function. So we have to take the square root. And that is where this normalization factor comes from. We have the square root of 2 over a. And uh, analogously, we can infer that root 2 on b and root 2 on c are the normalization constants for the y function and the z function. So we've done it. We've verified normalization. And now what you can do is you can take linear superpositions of, of these guys, linear combinations, which are also known as superpositions, of all of these wave functions, which are the stationary states. And you can describe any possible wave function for a particle in a 3D box. What you can also try and do is try and solve this problem with different box shapes. So imagine if this was a cylinder and not a rectangular prism. Or imagine if it was a sphere. You would have to use different coordinate systems, and they would be far more convenient. So different coordinate systems would definitely be an advantage for those different geometries. So hopefully this video is helpful. If uh, you want to see more videos on quantum mechanics, make sure you watch the videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. You can find them if you click over here.